Okay, so first thing I want to do is to show you, you know, how to make use of the spreadsheet. Okay, so I'm gonna close, yeah, close that first. <coughs> And then go to the drive, and I want to make sure that I switch my account from my as the owner of the drive you know, to somebody else. So we'll go to the modules, and then the shared folder is all the way up here. And it will open a new tab for that. <clears throat> so right here it shows that I'm logging in as my as owner, which is not what I want. So I'm going to switch to some props. So some profs is not the owner of this particular spreadsheet, so I'm going to show you guys how what you need to do in order to make use of the resources here. So right now I'm not the owner, and when I go to processor and go to assembler, it won't let me edit anything because I'm not the owner. So when I go to the tab called source and I try to make any changes, okay, so let's say we want to look at the comment here. Oh, it actually let me do it. <laughs> That's because you know it has it somehow it switches back to my other uh, identity. So let me switch it, switch to the other one. And this is what you should be seeing is view only, right? So what you need to do, you know, when you are not uh, the owner of this document, is to make a copy of it. Go to file. Now, when you go to file, it, you have two options. You have you know, add to my drive and also make a copy. What you really want is make a copy, okay? Because the other one, which is add to my drive, is adding a link to your drive. But it is a link to the original document, which you do not have ac the right access to. So what you need to do is to make a, uh, make a copy. So when you make a copy, it automatically makes a copy to your folder, okay? So you want to say a copy of this, and you know, in terms of folder, you can choose you know, where you want to put it. Um, so let's see. So go to my drive. And this one should be my drive from the perspective of some props. Okay. So we'll just go ahead and select the top level. <coughs> and we'll change the name. Just so that I can tell which one is which one. So this is TTP assembler. And now it opens it up. And we'll double check. It's under my some props identity, which is not the owner of the of the file. Uh, when we go to source this time, we now and you can see that the uh, view only is gone, which means now we can make changes to it. So you can now start to put a comment in, and everything is good. And this is the only way that I know of to run this thing. If you find out, you know, an offline way to use the assembler, let me know because I don't know of any way to run the assembler in an offline fashion. <clears throat> is that okay? You might be able to run it offline. I just do not know. Okay, you know, so you might, you, if you, if that is what you need to do, you might want to do some research like Google Sheets offline and see if you can do it. If you use Google Apps for work or Google Apps for education, you must enable offline access. Da, 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 da. Okay, so you might have a way to do it you know, offline, um, but I, you know, I will leave the research up to you because you know I personally always have you know access to the internet to use this resource. Is that okay so far? Just you know the steps of doing things. Okay, cool. <clears throat> Now, because you can do this, you can also do the same thing to all of the other resources in that same folder. In other words, if you say, oh, I want to have a copy of everything, okay, um, including, let's say, the assembler manual, um, and so that you can annotate, add your own notes and whatnot to it, do the same thing. You know, just go over here and you say, make a copy, and then make that copy your own in your own Google Drive. Then you have your own version to edit. Okay, if, if you want to add something to it, if you want to change the way things are described, you know, whatever you want to do, you can now you know, make your changes. So is that okay? So does that help explain you know, how to, okay, excellent. All right, so with this out of the way, are there any questions about the homework assignment? No questions about the homework assignment? All 
right? So does anyone want to remind me how far did we get in terms of talking about subroutines last time? Because I think, I'm pretty sure we got into subroutines. Yes, no, no, we did not. Okay, so that's, that's fine. <clears throat> All right, so if we did not get into subroutines last time, we can do it today. And the note is already linked here. Oh, maybe not. I forgot to link to this particular class. Okay, so we'll go ahead and link the notes first. So there are several notes that I need to link here. Um, features, modules, and I think it's 0304 and 0306. Okay, so let's go to the end here. So 0304 is calling and returning, and 0306 and 0307. So those three are to be linked, but I'll do one at a time. So we'll link this one first. Um, save link as, copy link location to here. Add an external URL, paste, and we'll just copy and paste the name too. Co uh, calling and returning from subroutines, there we go. I think I remember what we did last time. I think I used the uh, debugger, GDB, to illustrate a recursive function. Is that what I did? Yeah. So, so we kind of got started, but I did not get into enough stuff to explain it. So now we have the calling and returning from subroutines as a new module. I'll add the other two later on, because you know, today we're just probably going to focus on just one here. <coughs> Okay, so we are pretty much done with all the basic um, C constructs. Conditional statements, pre-checking loop, which is do a while you know, statement, and also post-checking statement, which is do while. Do while is kind of rare, you know, most people do not use it. Um, maybe 5% of the time we use you know, that particular loop, but most of the time we use pre-checking loops, which is also a hint because your homework assignment, you, you only need to use a pre-checking loop, you don't need a post-checking loop. Okay. So the other thing, so what we want to do today is to explain how this is done from the perspective of just any architecture in terms of concept, how it is done. And then we'll also take a look at how this is done using the t using TTP, the tax toy processor. Is that okay? So that's, that's our focus today. <clears throat> so when you think about calling a subroutine, you go like, no big deal, we know exactly how it's done. Okay, so in fact, you know, we'll, we'll just copy and paste this code and run it. Okay, we'll pick a terminal where the text is large enough, like this one, and go to the temp folder. I have no intention to save this file. Okay. So I'll just call this sub.c, and then we'll paste uh, middle p, there we go, and then we have gcc-g-o sub sub.c, program is compiled, gdb sub, put a breakpoint at main, okay, run the program. So we are now at line seven, which is the first call to f, right? So when a single step goes into the subroutine in f, but we are already at the end of f because f is empty, there's nothing to do in f. So the question is, where is it gonna go now? What do you think? The call to f is from line seven and I'm already at the end of the subroutine, where am I supposed to go back to? Line eight. line eight, okay, very good. So we go back to line eight, which is another call to F, okay? So we single step again, we go into the subroutine on line three, well, this is already at the end because the subroutine itself is empty. Um, and if I single step again, where do you think we're supposed to go to? Line nine, line nine. okay. Yep, okay, and it, then it returns and the whole program concludes without doing anything. But the question is, how does the subroutine know to go back to line eight the first time and line nine the second time? That becomes the question, right? Because unless we understand how it is done, at least conceptually, we won't be able to implement it in assembly. Does that make any sense? And we have seen all the instructions already, okay? Every single instruction you can possibly use in that processor, we have already introduced. There's no call, there's no return, okay? So we have to implement calling and returning using some more basic methods, only with the instructions that we're given with in this class. 
Is that okay so far? Okay. So kind of keep this in mind. Um, you know, this little demonstration here. And the biggest, the biggest question is how do we go from line three to line eight the first time with the first function call, and how do we get from line three to line nine in the second call? Okay. How does it know that oh this is the second call and we have to go back to a different line this time? So before we introduce the actual mechanism, we want to talk about you know stacks. Um, if you have taken CISP 430, you're probably exposed to the concept of a stack. Correct me if I'm incorrect. Is that right? Okay. But if you have not taken CISP uh, 430, which is okay, it's not a prerequisite of this class, we'll just take a really short discussion of what a stack is. So a stack is last in, first out, okay, LIFO, <clears throat> which basically means the last thing you put in is the first thing that you get out, and also the first thing that you put in is the last thing that you get out, okay? In real life, we use a lot of FIFO, I mean LIFOs, when it is not convenient, when it's not supposed to be the way things should be done. I'll give you a few examples. Uh, your refrigerator is one, okay? Especially if you have a freezer. Does anyone have a freezer at home? They're one of those, you know, kind of vertical freezer uh -huh. where the lid is on the top. Mo okay, no, okay, fine. <laughs> if, I would, if I were to draw a picture, it is a box like this, and here's a lid, okay? And it's a freezer, which means you know it keeps things you know frozen at a pretty low temperature to preserve you know meat and you know other types of products. But most people are lazy, okay? So when they buy new things from Costco, okay, like you know a whole big slab of you know ribs or whatever, they just put it on top. And when they buy more stuff, you know they put more stuff on top. So when they need to thaw something, it's like, oh, we have a big, you know, party going on, you know, next weekend, we need to thaw something, they just pick up whatever is on the top. That's a LIFO, which also means, you know, when this person has to move, because, you know, okay, that may or may not work, okay, Depend on, depending on how far this person has to move, because if it's not, you know, if, if it's within half an hour or one hour's of drive, that person may leave everything in the freezer, just tape it shut to move the entire thing. <laughs> so let's say this is cross-country moving. So there's no way this person can take everything in the freezer. So at that point, the person would have to clean up the entire freezer. So what do you think would be the date of the things at the bottom? Yeah, they'd be like the oldest. Or like the past time. decade, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it's last in, first out, okay? You know, the first thing you put in is the first thing that you get out, so you never get a chance to get to the bottom of the whole freezer, you know, where you, get all, where you keep all the good stuff. And even in the standing one, you still push the new things to the, or the first thing right. to the back. Right, but so it's not as difficult not as this one, because this one you have to actually bend over and kind of trying to get the stuff at the bottom, and so it's more work and more, <coughs> so people are have even less, uh, motivation to get to the stuff at the bottom. Okay, so the second example is a U-Haul truck. Okay, the first thing that you put into the U-Haul truck, if that's something that you need right away, you know, after you start driving, <coughs> forget it, you're not gonna get it because it's the last thing that you can get out of the U-Haul truck. Okay, so that's last in, first out, okay? But last in, first out has a very, very useful, um, has a lot of usefulness in computer science. Um, most programming languages are recognized by a stack machine. Okay? This is something that you will understand when you take a upper division class at a four-year university. Typically, it's called uh, the theory of computation, computational theory, automata, or something along that line. Um, but the term is coined by um, Alan Turing okay, to describe an entire classification of theoretical machines and behind you know, a push down acceptor or a stack machine is a stack, okay? So just by adding the concept of a stack to a finite state machine or finite state automata gives the machine a lot more capabilities. And most programming languages that we use today, like C, C++, Java, PHP, Perl, Python, and so on, they can all be recognized by a push down acceptor. Okay, which means it's relatively easy to write a parser for those languages. So stacks actually have a lot of implications in computer science. But today, we are not so concerned about those things. We are only concerned about how do we use a stack in assembly language. 
So what we want to do is we want to maintain the data structure of a stack uh, in very simple terms. So conceptually what we're doing is, this is really just a macro to uh, specify the size of the stack, like how big is the stack. So for the most part it's not utilized when we are actually using the stack. It's only used when we are reserving space for the stack. So in this case, we're reserving exactly 32 bytes for this particular stack. It is pretty small, okay? It's a small stack, but the stack actually doesn't have to be very big either. We'll, we'll talk about that later too. And then the second thing we also want to maintain, in addition to the area of the stack, is a stack pointer. So a stack pointer SP is, you know, as you can see here, it is a pointer. It's a pointer to the same type of each element on the stack. And in this particular example, you know, I'm using u int 8 underscore t to refer to bytes. So this will be as close to the TTP as possible because the TTP is also byte addressable. Is that okay so far? Okay. There are two operations, well, three operations that you need to con be concerned about when you're using a stack. First one is initialization. How do I make an quote unquote empty stack? Second one is how do we store something into a stack, which is also called pushing. And the third one is how do we retrieve something from the stack, which is also called popping. So when you push, you're storing something. When you retrieve, you're popping. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> so in TTP, you know, we assume the stack is from location 255 to the last byte available after the program takes up you know, whatever space that it needs to take up. So this is probably a good time when the picture helps to describe what I'm talking about. So we'll turn on our document camera. Capture device. There we go. And I just need to realign the... So I got this uh, three ring, uh, it's a half size three ring binder just for this purpose. <laughs> because I, I, I was getting a little bit uh, disorganized with all those uh, little notebooks. And with this, at some point I'll be able to do some kind of self-alignment thing, but right now it's still manually aligned. There we go. And I also got my four color <laughs> pen. <laughs> And it has a pencil too, so it's got five you know, things in it. Fancy. All right, so what we'll do is we're gonna take a look at the stack and also how we organize memory when we're dealing with the TTP, the toy processor. Okay. So if you look at this as the entire memory space, okay, which is very small as far as TTP is concerned because we, in terms of RAM, okay, so this is all RAM, the ROM is only used for microcode slices, so you know, that's the only purpose of that. So when you look at RAM um, of TTP, the lowest location is known as 0, 0 in hexadecimal, or 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 in, uh, in binary. Then the top location is known as FF in hexadecimal, which is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 in binary. So in this case, I'm just using hexadecimal just because it is, it's a lot faster to write in hexadecimal. Your program starts from here. When you write code and you assemble the program, it goes from here. So this is where you store your program. And when your program gets bigger and bigger, it goes in this direction. In, a, in other words, you know, the, your code will consume memory from location zero and up. Okay? Your stack, on the other hand, is just whatever is from location FF and down. So your stack is here, and it, go, it continues to go down, and there's no clear boundary of the stack as, we, as far as you know, we use the stack here. So at some point, your stack will run into your program, and that would be very, that, that would be very bad. Okay? Uh, with TTP, we do not have memory protection, so I cannot say, oh, this region is only for code purposes, and this region is only for stack purposes. If you go beyond this point and you try to overwrite other locations, you know, we'll have a uh, process of fault. I, I did not program it to have that kind of capability. So your program is perfectly capable of wiping itself out when it consumes too much stack space. Is that okay? Okay. 
So we want to start to grow from high location to low location. So that means when your stack is empty, so when we look at just the stack itself, this is not the entire RAM, this is just a stack. So when you look at the stack, this is still low memory location, this is high memory location. Your stack pointer is pointing to um, a certain location. Whatever your stack pointer points to is the last thing that you push on the stack. In other words, in this particular case, this whatever is at this location is the last item that you push on the stack that you have not retrieved yet. Is, is that okay? You can also look at the stack pointer as you know when you open up the freezer, that's the first item you see. The stack pointer points to the first item you see when you open up the freezer. So when you pop, which is retrieving an item, that's the item that you're retrieving. Are we still doing okay so far? Okay. <clears throat> if you want to add another item to the stack, in other words, you want to store another food item into the freezer, this is what you do. So you're gonna use, oh, this is fancy, I can change color. Okay, so this is the new item. So the new item is gonna be below the first item, and then you have to move your stack pointer down in order to point to the new item that you add into the stack. I know this is counterintuitive, because most people think the stack will grow up, but it actually grows down, okay? Are we doing okay so far with that kind of not so intuitive way of using a stack? So yep. is, it, is it like a predefined <coughs> distance from the program that the stack has, or? Say that one more like, time. You see, like how you put the stack at the very top of the RAM, is that, is that like a fixed distance, or is it always gonna go as high as it can in the RAM, or how does that work? Um, it, it's convention, so in this case, you know, our convention is to use the top portion of the RAM space for stack, because um, we don't know, you know, how much space the program is going to take up. Um, you can always use a label, you know, and just have a whole bunch of byte, zero, byte, zero, byte, zero to allocate, but instead of doing that, I'm just saying, okay, let's use the end of the entire memory space for stack purposes. Okay. Yep. So that's a good question. Oh, All right. Mm -hmm. What happens if the stack does intercept with the program? Like, how it will overwrite your program. So it just like breaks it, basically. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and that happens a lot, you know, in the good old days. You know, like in the good old days when we use processors that do not have protective mode. Um, all the processors that we use today, you know, are protective mode processors, or at least they have a protect mode, protective mode in operation. So when your PC, you know, with a pro with Windows, okay, or with Linux, when your stack is getting too big, your 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 stack partner keeps going down and down and down. Beyond a certain point, it would cause a segmentation fault. It would just say that, hey, this location cannot be written to because it is not allocated as a part of your stack. Okay. And in fact, we can we can illustrate that concept relatively easily too. So you know, it's it's fun to watch it. <coughs> And I can write a very simple program to use up all the stack. Okay. Um, we'll say I'll just call it stack here. So that would do it. <laughs> so what is main going to return actually? <laughs> we don't know. We never say anything, right? <clears throat> But it will consume all the stack. Now, this is also a good de demonstration of how the stack is used in function calls. Okay, but you know, just to show you what it looks like when you run out of space, you know, in a C program, uh, GCC dash O stack stack dot C segmentation fault. That's all it does. That's all it tells you. It's like okay. You can also do this in GDB. Um, you know, which actually can show you a few more things. <clears throat> so when you do it in GDB, you know, you actually get a chance to evaluate how big the stack really is. So we'll put a breakpoint in main. Uh, oh, okay. I didn't specify which program. Uh, I think there's a way to load it here. No. Nope. Okay, fine. There we go. Nope. It's not main. It's called stack. Okay, we'll put a breakpoint in main, we run the program, and then we'll delete the um, breakpoint. But at this point, I can also print all the registers. 
IR info register can print all the registers. And one particularly is important to us, it's called a stack pointer. Uh, it is RSP here. So I can just focus on uh, RSP and just say uh, print dollar RSP and it is this particular number, okay? It's, you know, it, the actual number doesn't really matter, okay? So what we want to do is to compare what it is now as opposed to what it is when the program has crashed, okay? So a C will continue execution. Since I removed that breakpoint already, it will just keep going until it crashes, right? And it crashes, okay? So now we can look at the stack order again, and it is different. You can see it is uh, quite different because this digit used to be an F, and now it's a seven. So they're off by eight, zero, 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 zero in hexadecimal, okay? If you want to find out exactly um, how many bytes is on the stack or how many bytes you can use before it runs out, you can just you know, do a quick estimation of dollar one minus dollar two. Dollar one refers to the result of the first print, and dollar two refers to the result of the second print. So when you do the subtraction, it tells this is a decimal number. It's about eight uh, megabytes. So your a, a typical Linux you know, kernel will give a process. Uh, eight kilobytes, eight megabytes, sorry, eight megabytes for stack space. Is that okay? Yep, go ahead. Was it protected? Mm -hmm. If it started to overwrite the program, would everything just crash? It will continue to uh, overwrite locations until it overwrites the location where you're going to execute next with an opcode that is not reasonable, and then it will, then it will crash. But since it's protected mode, it knows where it's supposed to end, so it it gives you a segmentation fault when you get to that point. And all operating systems today are protected mode, so that includes Windows, Mac OS X, Linux, uh, anything that you run on a phone, and even a watch these days, they are all protected mode. Yep? Is the, is the heap part of the structure? No, heap is separate. Okay, so with the heap, it's a little bit interesting because the heap technically does not belong to the program itself. Um, when you say new or um, malloc in C or C++, what happens is um, there's a memory manager um, library that is in charge of you know, dishing out you know, chunks of, small chunks of memory. And on the other side of that library, it talks to the operating system. So it will actually talk to the operating system and say, hey, I need a chunk of memory, a big chunk of memory. And then when it gets the big chunk of memory, it will start to do the D out allocation, turn it into smaller chunks as you request you know, smaller chunks. So the heap is technically not really a part of your program space per, you know, these days. It is actually a resource provided by the operating system. Okay, very good questions. So are we okay so far with the concept of the stack? It grows down, okay? So the most important part is it grows down because you can see how the stack pointer used to point to a much higher location compared to the time when it has crashed. So that means you know, as you consume stack space, the stack pointer goes lower and lower and lower and lower. So we're, are we good on that one? Okay, excellent. <coughs> All right, so since we already know the stack is gonna grow lower and lower, this is how you do it in C. You know, if you want to store X on the stack. The first thing you do is you decrement the stack pointer because the convention is the stack pointer points to the last thing that you push on the stack. So we don't want to overwrite that, right? You know, because we, we want to say, okay, we want to keep that and then use the next location to store the new thing that I want to store. So that's why the first thing you do is to decrement the stack pointer. And in this particular case, you know, SP minus minus is just as good as minus minus sp, which is as good as sp equals sp minus one, because the expression itself, the value of this expression is not used anywhere. So whether you do you do a pre-increment or post, a pre-decrement or post-decrement, doesn't make any difference. So once you allocate using this uh, sp minus minus, then whatever the stack pointer is pointing to after this is now free space. So now you can just go ahead and store whatever you want to store, which is X, into where the stack pointer is pointing to. So are we doing okay so far with this concept? How do you store something into a stack in C and C++? 
And as you can see, this one is really easy to implement. No linked list whatsoever. Not like uh, 430. Is that right? In 430, do they use linked list for a stack? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. This is like no, 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 no linked list. No, no nothing like that. Just an array and a pointer. Uh, hmm? Because, like, I feel like the professor was concerned that if we did that, like, the the, the pointers wouldn't point to the right things all the time or something like that. Uh, it was weird. Like, 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 sound like he thought that the the pointer was something like that. Um, the reason why you use a linked list in CISP 430 is because you don't want to preoccupy a chunk of memory. So you're allocating for each thing that you're storing. So if you only need to store five things, it will only take up the space of five things. So you're not pre-allocating a stack of say 500 items, but you're only storing like five items. Okay. That is a um, it's a reasoning that makes sense when you're using multi-processing in a conventional desktop slash you know server type of environment. Okay, but when you are writing code for a robot, a rover, you know that is running on Mars, it doesn't make sense anymore. Especially when you are dealing with C and C plus plus. What is the biggest problem with uh, new and delete in a conventional sense? There are several problems with that approach, but one is really, really kind of like the crux of the whole thing is like, yep, yeah, this is not what we do with embedded systems, real-time systems. What do you think that's going to be? Has anyone heard of memory fragmentation? No. They never talked about memory fragmentations in other classes? Okay, so memory fragmentation is not unlike disk fragmentation, but it is fatal in a way. Disk fragmentation means you know your file is chopped up into small chunks and they're all over the display, you know, all over the you know, your hard drive. Um, which means you know when if you use a conventional mechanical hard drive, the disk head will have to move several times in order to you know, locate you know, the entire content of the file. And that make, makes it very slow because your disk head takes about you know uh, how many milliseconds? Eight milliseconds now. Okay, let's say it's eight milliseconds, which is uh, eight thousandth of a second, okay, to go from one track to another track, which to us is really fast, but to the computer that's a long time because you know you're talking about something that can compute like four billion additions per second, and your disk head it takes eighteen milliseconds, right? So in the time that your disk head is needs to move from one track to another track, how many calculations can be done? You're talking about four billion. Yeah, per second, as opposed to 18, okay, 18 is exaggerated, let's make it 8, 8 milliseconds. So you you need to multiply these two, 8, 4 billion times 0. 0.008 is what? 32 million, okay? So in the time that your disk head moved from one track to another track, your super duper high end processor could have performed 32 million additions, subtractions, and whatnot. And that's only talking about a single core. Single ALU, single core. <laughs> and guess what? You got multiple ALUs per core, and then you have eight or 12 cores on the processor, and they're all twiddling their thumbs. <laughs> While this cat is going like, I'm going to go from here <laughs> to here. And then I'm going to wait for the disk to rotate so that the right sector is under the disk head, right? So, you know, so the processor, you know, your actual ALUs, is looking at everything in slow motion. You know, we look at a 10,000 RPM hard drive and go like, wow, that is really fast. Your, your ALU, which is running with a clock speed of 4, kilohertz, 4 gigahertz, is looking at the rotation goes like, wow, it is as far as the moon revolves around the Earth. <laughs> yep, so that's why, you know, disk fragmentation is bad news for those of you who want the, the top frame rate for your games, right? I mean, that's, that's why you care about disk mm -hmm. fragmentation is, you know, I only got 60 frames per second. All my friends are getting 200 frames per second, and that's why I'm losing this game. Because <laughs> I've heard those arguments before. 
in my own household. <laughs> <clears throat> but fortunately, the, the good thing about this fragmentation is it's not fatal, okay? It just takes longer, okay? So even in the worst possible case, every single file is scattered and shotgun all over the place. You know what? It just takes longer. And that's only with a conventional mechanical hard drive. If you have one of those you know, SSDs, it doesn't matter. There's no disk head to move, okay? Now, I'm not 100% sure about the internal mechanism of an SSD, so it might still incur a slight de delay when things are all over the place, but it's not gonna be nearly as bad as a mechanical hard drive. Okay, memory def uh, fragmentation is fatal in the sense that once you fragment it to a certain level, you can no longer allocate memory anymore, and then your whole program would just die. Okay? So the way it works, or the way, the, the reason why you can have fatal memory fragmentation, now this is de definitely not related to assembly language programming, but nonetheless it is important. Okay, so let's say this is your heap. Okay, this is your heap, and you have been allocating and deallocating, okay? So if you only allocate and deallocate for one single class of objects, fragmentation does not happen, because every time you deallocate, it's the same size. Every time you allocate, it's the same size. So it's not a problem. But very few programs has, uh, has an internal structure where you only use one single class of objects. We're not talking about subclasses or superclasses. We're talking about a single class, okay? So you typically have you know, holes in memory like this of varying sizes. And how these holes you know, start to get created in your heap space depends a lot on how things are allocated and deallocated. So as time goes on, these holes you know, can get you know, kind of all over the place. So at this point, you know, if you look at the remaining space, you know, um, there's a lot of space left. But if I ask you to allocate a particular size, that may not be possible anymore. So at that point, new has could not do a single thing. You would just return a null value to say that, nope, I cannot allocate what you need anymore. And depending on what the, how your program is structured, usually that is fatal. Usually your program is just kind of throw its hand up and go like, okay, I cannot do a single thing now. Just crash, okay? So that is really bad. It's called memory fragmentation. And it happens only to C and C++ programs that make use of me dynamic memory allocation but using the default memory uh, uh, allocation, deallocation. Yep. Is it fixable? It is fixable in the sense that you can um, you can overload new and delete. Okay, those are just operators, so you can yeah. overload new and delete. So when you overload new and delete, what you can do is to manage your own array. So instead of using the true you know dynamic allocation and deallocation you are managing a pre-allocated array with a little bitmap to see which one is actually in use and which one is not in use, or some other means to keep track of you know, what is free and what is allocated. So in that case, no matter how many times you allocate and deallocate, you won't have fragmentation because you know, all of those things are inside the same box, and it has no implication to things outside of the box. Uh, Java gets around this problem by um, uh, garbage collection. Yep. And uh, this is only a problem for like the pro for the program's runtime duration, right? Like afterwards, it doesn't damage anything like a like permanently, right? No, it does not. But okay. but the program itself will stop functioning because yeah. it can no longer allocate memory uh, when you have you know, severe uh, fragmentation. Yep. So so it's not really related to this class, you know, but it is something that is kind of important. At least you need to know the term of your know, memory fragmentation. Um, you know, if you want to read up on it and find out, you know, okay, what are the solutions to that problem, okay, you can just read up on it. But knowing it is important. All right, switching back to the notes, okay. So now we have retrieval, okay. So we, we, ha we know how to uh, allocate and use, and now we have retrieval. So when you're retrieving something from the stack, you know that the stack pointer is pointing to the last thing that you push on the stack. So just use it right now. Okay, in other words, you open up your freezer, first item, that's what I'm gonna get. Okay, that's what the stack pointer is pointing to. So that's why the first operation is to dereference the stack pointer, go to that particular location on the stack, 
and then uh, stored in X, usually X is a, is a register in assembly language programming, but this is C code, so C is, so X can be any variable. But after that, you have to remember to do one thing. You have to deallocate that space on the stack so that that particular location is once again available for the next push operation. Is that okay? Now, you can, yeah, go ahead. So when you put SP minus minus, it just moves down? Downwards. It's moving the pointer itself. Okay. Yep. All it does is to advance the pointer, and all this all this is doing is to reverse the pointer. Okay. Is yeah. that because it's going downwards? Minus minus moves down, and then plus plus moves back up. Yep. Okay. Yep. Exactly. All right. So, are there any questions at this point? Okay. No questions. All right. So the next question is, how do we initialize the stack pointer? at the very beginning of the entire thing. Well, we know the stack is growing down, so that means you know, the initial stack pointer, this will be displayed on the, it, it, it will show better here. So to do the initialization, which I'm gonna use red to represent, is to move the stack pointer just one location past the actual end of the area that you have allocated for the stack. So typically, it would say, oh, that's bad. We are pointing to the location that actually does not belong to the stack. But because in a push operation, what do you do? What is the first thing you do when you're pushing? You decrement the stack pointer. So the moment you decrement the stack pointer, which is in red at this point, it now points to the first available location on the stack, which is actually a part of the stack. So that's why you know, when you initialize the stack pointer, you do not initialize the stack pointer to, to exactly the last location of the stack which, because you'll be wasting one location in that case. You have to make it point one location past the end of the stack. Then you can use every single location that you have allocated for the stack. So is that okay so far? Okay, all right, cool. All right. So we can go through some exercises to kind of just use the stack, you know, in assembly, um, and we'll see what happens, you know, when we do those things. Okay. So I'm gonna use my um, document camera here to illustrate an example, and you guys can tell me what you know what should be the result of this. Okay. So we'll say int. Okay, u and eight underscore t, um, x and y are both bytes. Okay, and we say x equals eight, y equals I don't know, fifteen. Okay, and then I'm just using these pseudo operations. We'll push push x, push y, and then we'll say x equals pop. Okay, y equals pop. So this is obviously just pseudocode. You know, all I'm trying to express is wh whatever the value is of x is, push it on the stack. Whatever the value of y is, push it on the stack. And then we pop things from the stack. The first thing we pop on this, the first value we pop from the stack, store that in x. The second thing we put onto the stack, store that in y. What do you think would be the values of x and y when this is all done? So x will be 15, y will be 8. Yep they will be reversed, right? They will be swapped. So this is one trick to do swap operation when you have access to a stack, is you just push things and then you pop things in a reverse order. So I'm gonna use this as an example to illustrate you know, how to implement all of this in assembly, okay? All right, so the objective is we're pushing eight first, okay? So to push eight, to do it in assembly, the way we do it is we use an LDI instruction. You have to use a particular register like A or whatever to do it. So we'll load it into A. Oh, but where is our stack pointer? Now you can use a memory location as a stack pointer, but that would be very, very, very inefficient. That's what, what that, that, that would not be what you want to do. So the way we use a stack pointer is we, we, uh, we dedicate a particular register as a stack pointer. So in this case, we're gonna use register D. Okay, so D is our stack pointer. So the first thing you need to do is to initialize the stack pointer. The way I initialize the stack pointer is like this. So the D is at the highest possible location. 
That seems to be exactly opposite to what I just said, right? But what happens when you decrement d at this point? When d is zero, what is zero minus one? It, all, it will cross the boundary back to FF, okay? So that's why, you know, zero turns out to be, quote unquote, the highest memory location when wrapping around is taken into consideration. Is that making any sense? Okay. Okay, so this is for initializing the stack pointer. So initialize stack pointer. So we load A into eight, and then what we do when we push is we just do a ST instruction store to whatever D has. Oh, I forgot one thing too. Okay, I can save it here. So the first thing we need to do also is to decrement D because we have to remember to reserve the space to store this eight. So that's why we have to decrement D first. Then we store the eight to um, the stack corner where it points to after the decrement. And then we do the same thing, decrement D again to prepare to prepare for the next push, LDI LDI. Um, let's say this one is in B, uh, fifteen, and then we do the ST again. This is LDI, STD, A, like so. So these three instructions is corresponding to this push. These three instructions are corresponding to this push here. Is that okay so far? Okay. Then we need the pop operations. So the pop operations are exactly the opposite. You do a LD first, and in this case, we are LDing into. Uh, oops, this is supposed to be B. Sorry. Okay, fix that. So when we do the LD, um, X is register A. So we do a LD to A from D, and then we increment the stack pointer. So these two instructions corresponds to this. And then the next one is LD, B, comma, D. And we also have to remember to increment the stack order. And that corresponds to the last pop instruction. Do we have any questions about this picture? Yeah, yeah. are the parentheses necessary for all the D stuff? Or? Yes. Okay, yeah. The parentheses are needed because I specifically made, made the syntax this way so that it is clear that register D is dereferenced. So that when we read the assembly code, we know that we are not copying from D to A. Instead, we are going to where D points to, copy the content of that memory location to the other operand. Okay, very good. All right, well, let's go ahead and give it a try. So we'll go ahead and write this code in the assembler. So in this case, I'm using my new copy of the assembler, which should behave the same way as the other one. So we'll clear out you know, everything in here first. <clears throat> and then we'll just write the instruction. D is the stack order. And the initialization of D is to put a zero into it. So now we are down to the push operations. So the first one is push, um, push eight. Now I'm going to combine these two. You know, this is actually legal in C as well, okay? Because you can do an assignment inside an expression, and then whatever the result of the assignment is is now pushed. So that's actually perfectly valid as a C syntax. Um, so we'll do a decrement D and LDI A8, and then we do STD A. The next one is push Y equals 15, and then we do the same thing, which is decrement D. You know, reserve the space, LDI B15, and then we do STDB, and then we do the pop operation. So the first one is X equals to pop. So that is done by LD into register A because A and X are the same thing, B and Y are the same thing. And then you have to remember to increment D because we want to deallocate that byte so that it can be used again if we do want to push uh, other items. And then y equals to pop. And that is done by LDB, D, and increment D again. So I'll put a halt instruction here. So the trick with a stick, with, the, with using the stack, is when you're all done, 
the stack pointer should still point to exactly the same thing as in, in the very beginning of the whole program. Okay? So it's called balancing the stack. If your stack pointer starts off with a particular value, and after you perform some operations, it is not the same as what you start off with, that means your stack pointer is not balanced, and that means you need to find out, okay, where did I forget to increment, or where did I forget to decrement? Because they should be the same. All right, so when this is all done, we'll go ahead and, so you can see there are no syntax errors of any kind here, so that's good. If you forget the parentheses in a ST instruction, I think it will complain, so let's check out. Yep, so it says it'll register Y is expected, but that's because you know, y, register Y is supposed to be in parentheses, but that's the kind of message that you get when you do not use the syntax correctly. So we go to RAM file, we download the content of RAM file, and we can use comma separate the value. I think tab works too, but CSV you know, is known to work already, so I'm just gonna keep it this way. Um, we'll just call this one stack.csv. And then we start up the logic sim. So we go to uh, download logic sim. And then the other part is in my processor subfolder. There we go. Um, you uh, also, you know, uh, since I have updated the ROM file to the microcode, you have to remember to reload it. Make sure that you use the latest latest version. Okay. So we'll reset this, load the image into RAM, and that's going to be in my temp folder called stack.csp. And now the program is ready to run. Control K would start the clocking, so we'll just go ahead and do Control K until it is no longer moving. We know it's not moving when the PC doesn't change. There we go, Control K again to stop the whole thing. And then we go into the registers to see that, to make sure that uh, register A and B have the, uh, have the values re uh, reversed. A should be 15, which is F, and B should be eight, which is just eight itself. So register A, okay, let me zoom in so you can see. So register A indeed has a value of 0F, which is 15, and register B, in fact, has a value of 08. But we also want to check the stack pointer. The stack pointer is register D itself. It started off with a value of 0. We initialize it to 0, okay? And it ends up with a value of 0, which is correct. The stack is balanced. Are we okay so far? Okay, all right. So with this, explained, okay, you know, in other words, going back to the uh, document camera, with this already explained, the next thing we, what we want to do is to say, okay, so what, how, how do we call a subroutine and how do we return from a subroutine? Because that's the, that's the, that was the original question. This is kind of like a slight detour because we need to understand the concept of a stack in order to explain how call and return is done. Okay. So we switch to a different page. And then we will start to write that code. It's all, you know, some of this is in the notes too, so, you know, it, it's already there. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is to say, okay, from the caller's perspective, what do we do when we say call function f? And by the way, function f does not return anything in this case. It doesn't have any parameters. All we're trying to do is to call the subroutine, okay? So what do we do in this case? The last thing we do it's easy to translate because the last thing that we do is a JMPL, JMPI sorry, to F. F being the label identifying the beginning of the subroutine. So that one is easy, right? Because we have to continue execution in the subroutine. The question is, what do we have to do prior to jumping into the subroutine? We have to remember, we have to, the caller is responsible to leave behind a bread crumb, a, be, a piece of crumb, and say, and tell the this is an agreement between the caller and the callee, is to say, okay, here's a piece of your breadcrumb that will tell you how to get back to me. But the caller is the one responsible to place the breadcrumb where the callee can expect to find it. Okay? And that's gonna be the stack. So what we need to do 
is to say, okay, here's the continuation point. Okay, the so continuation point, I'm going to use count one here as continuation point one, okay, which is the, be the, the beginning of the next call. So if this is the, the one, then we have to say LDI, okay, use one register, A is fine at this point, C O N T one. So what this is doing is A will now contain the address that is labeled by count one. And then the next thing we do is decrement D, D E C D, which means we are allocating a byte on the stack so that we are going to store something into it. What we're gonna store into that byte is ST instruction and we're going to store register A into it. So when you, when you combine the, the three instructions, all we are doing is pushing cont1 on the stack. We're putting a little piece of breadcrumb and say, here, okay, subroutine, when you're done, use this information to help you get back to where you're supposed to go. Is that okay? So now you look at the perspective from the subroutines perspective, okay? So here's F, okay? This is the actual definition of F. Void F, uh, open and close curly brace, which means F doesn't do a single thing, okay? That's fine, not a problem. Uh, we'll start with the F colon as a label. In other words, you use a label to identify the starting point or the entry point of a subroutine. Typically, we use exactly the same name. There's no reason why we should not use the same name as the subroutine itself. And it's got nothing to do if you want to convince yourself that, yes, I want to emphasize that this subroutine doesn't do a single thing. Fine. Put a no up here. I don't do a single thing. Then what you do is you say, oh, okay, I'm done. What do I do when I'm done? I need to go back to the caller. But remember, the agreement is between the caller and the callee. The caller said, find the return address on the stack. That's the agreement. So what the callee has to do is to pop the return address and then utilize that in a return, in, in a mechanism to continue execution where it is supposed to go back to. So we'll do the pop first, okay? In the previous example, we used the pop already or the sequence of instructions that we do the pop. The first thing to do when you, when you do a pop is simply a LD instruction. We'll, do, we'll use register B in this case. So we are gonna pop um, the value currently on the stack into register B. And don't forget to increment D at this point because otherwise the stack is not gonna be balanced, okay? The moment you consume that item on the stack, increment the stack pointer so that that location is once again available for other operations. So after these two instructions, the LD and the inc inc increment instruction, now we are ready to transfer. We are ready to continue execution at the location indicated by B. That is why we have the JMP instruction that has no I after that. Because this instruction is just copying register B directly into the program counter. Remember, the program counter is telling the processor where to get the next instruction, and therefore, we are now continuing execution where B is pointing to, but B is getting th that value from the stack. Who put that value on the stack? The caller did. What value was put on the stack? Cont1. So as a result, by the time we get to the JMPB instruction, right after this, the next instruction to execute will be whatever is at count one. So are we doing okay so far with this analysis? You know, how call is done, which is the top portion of the discussion, and how return is done, which is the bottom section of this thing. So if I want to emphasize, these five lines together is the calling of F. These three lines together is basically the same thing as a return in C and C++. Is that okay? Is everybody convinced that you know this code is doing what a call and a return should do? <laughs> no? I don't see anyone here who 
took CISP 300 from me because I haven't taught that class for a few years. Maybe you did. Did anyone take? Yeah, no? No? Okay. Because when I taught CISP 300, I taught it in a way to explain how call and return are done using quote unquote stack operations. So, you know, students who took CISP 300 from me would actually look at this and go, like, oh, yeah, that reminds me of you know, something that I took maybe a year ago. But that's okay. I'm hoping that this is working so far. Okay. All right. So we're going to uh, uh, copy this code into the assembler and then we'll run the program and then see what it does. Okay. So we'll go to. Okay. To do this, I'm going to start a just a plain notepad ish kind of file, uh, application and then we'll just enter the program here. So the first thing we need to do is an LDID 0 to initialize the stack corner. And then we'll go ahead and implement main. Now this label is totally useless, but I do want to use it here to identify this is what main needs to do if we're translating that program into assembly code. Okay, Just to mark where the quote unquote main function is. All right, so the first thing we need to do is LDI a cont1, which is continuation address one, decrement D to save, reserve a space on stack, STD a to save the return address on the stack, transfer control to the subroutine F, and continuation point is over here. And then we basically do the whole thing again for the second call to F, but we have to remember to change the continuation point to cont2, and then main itself is done. We put a halt here. The subroutine f, okay, this is subroutine f. Uh, we put a no op just to emphasize that this subroutine doesn't do a single thing. LD b from d, increment d to uh, deallocate that byte on the stack, jmp b to continue execution to the point where we're supposed to go. Okay, so this is the entire program. This particular program matches the code of what is in the browser. Let me switch to the browser first. So it matches the code. I thought I had that main subroutine somewhere. Yep, at the very beginning. There we go. So when you look at this code in C, it is now written in assembly like this. Okay, let me let me do this. There you go, side by side. Left hand side in C, right hand side in TTP assembly. So yep. function is called twice. Okay. The function is called twice from main. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then we copy and paste this code. Okay, from the notepad, just Control A to select all, control C to copy, and then you go to the browser, go to the assembler tab, go to the source tab of the assembler, and paste it here. There we go. Make sure that you don't have any error on the right hand side, and we are good here. Um, and then we go to RAM file, the RAM file tab, file, download as, CSV, and we'll call this call return.csv. Go back to LogiSim. Reset first, okay? Always remember to reset the processor. And then you go to the RAM portion, right click, load image. And then we load call return this time. Call return, open it. And we now got the program. Now, obviously, when we run this program, there's no observable output. Okay, other than register D getting you know, changed a few times and register A and register B getting something. It's really hard to double check and make sure this program does work the way it's supposed to. That F is called twice and each time it returns to the right place. So, but there's a way to do it. So when you're debugging a program in Logisim, it really helps to go to logging. And you can log to a table that is internal to Logisim, which is great if you don't want to use your own you know, text editor to look at the file. 
Um, but you can also specify a file. You can go to File tab and click Enable. Okay, you have to select first. Okay, so find a you know, give it the file name. So I'm gonna call it your stack.log. Okay, you don't have to use the log extension. You can use any extension you want. It's just a text file. Now it is enabled, and I'm gonna include header line, which just basically explains you know, what each what each column is. Then you can go back to selection and select what you want to log. There are several things that are really kind of important to log. The program counter is definitely important because you know, every single time you change one of the things that is being watched on this list, it will create a row in the log. And the program counter is the one that's changing all the time. Every time you move on to the next instruction, the program counter changes. So even if a program only has no op instructions, the program counter will still be changing a lot. So it's a good way to track your program and say, where am I going, where am I going? The only thing you have to keep in mind is the program counter tends to be one more than what you think it should be. Because every single time we do a fetch, it auto increments, okay? So when you look at the program counter compared to the effect of, of that row, typically it is one more than the instruction that you're actually executing. So keep that in mind. Second thing we might want to keep in mind would be stuff in RAM. So RAM is kind of big. It has got 255, 256 locations. We don't need to look at all of those. We just need to look at the last two items. Now, this second last item really should not be touched. Okay, we, because you know we are doing two calls, but they are at the same level. So the same byte, which is the byte at location 255, should be used twice. Okay, it is used both for the first call and also the second call. And the reason being, after the first call, it is deallocated already. So by the time we get to the second call, it is reusing the same location to store the return address. So that's why, you know, I'm just tracking both, but two, location 254 should never be changed in this particular program. Um, if you want to, you can keep track of the registers. So when you, this is the ALU and this is the register bank. So if you want to, you can keep track of all the registers. Um, I'm not going to be tracking all of those, you know, but for one, th one thing I want to track is register D itself. And I also want to track register B because register B is the one that is getting the return address. So if I track register B, I can clearly see Oh, register B is getting the return address, and then we continue execution at where it's supposed to go. So these are the things that I'm going to track. <clears throat> um, okay, once we specify what we are tracking, we can cl close the window, do a Control K to turn on the clocking. It's clocking at you know, four kilohertz right now, and we know the program has reached the halt instruction both by looking at the instruction register, 01 is the opcode of the halt instruction, and we can also tell by looking at the, the program counter, which is 0F, the way you map your um, program counter to which line of the program you're dealing with is to look at the assemble tab in the assembler. I know it is really busy, okay, but when you look at column F, uh, column W, it is the address in hexadecimal. So when we try to match that with PC, the program counter, which is 0F, remember 0F is one more than the actual instruction that is being executed. So the actual instruction is at location 0E. So when we look back here, we look at lo location 0E, and it is indeed the halt instruction. So this is how you kind of look at everything in order to check that your program is you know, at the right place. So we know the program is now halting at the right place, which is good, okay? And then we go back here, we stop the clocking, and then we can now look at the file that we, that we call uh, stack.log, okay? So that's, a, that's a just, a, it's just a regular text file. So we go to a command line, okay? I'm just gonna use another tab here to look at that particular file. It's called stack.log. And it is a little bit wide, and unfortunately the formatting is a little bit uh, off. So basically this is our program counter. This is read location 254, location 255. This is register D, and I think this is register B, okay? 
Is that okay so far? Okay. So when you look at the program counter, it went from zero, which is good because you know, every program starts from location zero. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, five, six, six. You know, some instructions take you know, two cycles to execute. And then we have um, location seven, and then we jumped, okay? We jumped from location seven to location F. So now the question is, is location F the entry point of function F? Because that's, it really should be, right? So we can check that. We can go back to the assembler tab, and you look at this line here. It is indeed location 15, which is 0F in hexadecimal. So we know it, it got to the right place. Did it push something on the stack first? Okay, so that's the next question. The third column, which is this column here, is location 255. This is location 254, which, was, which is never changed in the entire execution of this program as expected, okay? I just put it here just in case, right? So that was never changed. But when you look at this part here, okay? This is where we push something on the stack. We push the value of 0, 8 on the stack. So what we are supposed to push on the stack is the continuation point, right? So now we have to look at cont1 and say, okay, is cont1 actually 0, 8? We go back to the spreadsheet. We look up the definition of cont1, which is on line 8. Indeed, it is location 8 as well. So we know we were pushing the right thing on the stack. We go back to this code. This is the entry point of function f. So all of this stuff is in function f. So we have 15, 16, 17, 17, 18, 18, 19, and then back to location 8. So it looks like the program is doing it correctly because we're done with executing whatever the code is in function f, and then we continue execution in location 0, 8. But we can also check and see um, whether register b is affected correctly. Indeed, register b is getting the value from the stack itself. And then after that, the stack pointer, which is this you know, f, ff here, is also incremented back to 0 to deallocate that byte. Is that okay? And then we continue execution at 0, 8, which is the cont, cont 1. And then if you keep scrolling down, okay, you will see it is going to call again. And then the same thing happens, except the return point is no longer 8. The return point is now 1110, which is an E. Because, and then we execute, we continue execution at the subroutine, which is starting at location uh, 1111. And then when it's done, we got back to location 1110, uh, which is 0E. Um, and that's where the halt instruction is located. And that's why it never moved forward any further from this point. Is that OK? Are there any questions about the explanation of this trace? Because that is the best debugging tool that you have when you're debugging TTP programs, is to look at the trace. Any questions? No questions? Let's see, we, we have three minutes. Do you think we can do a recursive subroutine? Let's try. Uh, okay. I may not be able to finish the, the translation, but we can definitely get started with the idea. Okay. And you say, but you know, we haven't really talked about parameters or local variables. How can we have recursive subroutines? Well, we can still use global variables, right? So I'm going to write it in, OK, I, I can type a lot faster than I can handwrite. I'm just, I'm, I'm just handwriting because of the uh, new pen that I got. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so I'm just going to write this in. Uh, we'll put an x here. Um, and then here's function f. I'll go back and define it a little bit more later on. And here's function main. And we'll initialize a x to, well, I don't know, 3, OK? And to make this more fun, we'll have another one here, u in 8, y. 
we go. And we'll initialize. Oh, why is not going to be initialized? Okay, so we'll leave it uninitialized. We'll call f once from here, and we'll return a zero in main. So inside function f, we're going to say if x is greater than or equal to zero, but that suffices. Okay, in C, uh, we're going to do something. So if it is greater than or equal to, z if it's greater than one, this is what we'll do. So we're going to say um, x gets x minus one or decrement, um, and then we call f again, and then when it returns, we'll say y is y plus y, like that, okay? The else is corresponding to the case when x is in fact zero. This is the only time we initialize y to one. So what do you think this program is going to do? So explain it one more time, okay? If x is zero, y is one. That's the end of the <coughs> recursion. If x is greater than zero, then we'll, walk, we'll do the recursion. When the recursion comes back, we'll double the value of y. So what do you think f is actually doing with conjunction of the global variables x and y? y how does y relate to x? Y is one greater than x. Not, well, only when x is zero. When x is some other value, how does y relate to x? What is the most general description between that relationship? Uh, y is left shifted by x by the time. Exactly. Or 2 to the power of x. Okay? Y is 2 to the power of the original value of x. And it's done using a very awkward way. It is recursive, and yet it uses global variables. But the point of this one is we can, we can call f from inside f using the mechanism that we just talked about, okay? So if you are done with your homework assignment, you know, the division problem, and you go like, that's too easy, and you want to take on a challenge, okay? This is a great way to learn it too, okay? Because we have already introduced the actual mechanism of calling and returning. So if you want to practice, and basically how I would study for this class is really just to look at all of these things, you know, these cliffhangers at, at, the, at, at the end of the class, I would just go home and try to implement this thing myself, okay? And so and by, at the beginning of the next class, I will give you the solution, okay? But it really helps if you have the time over the weekend to try to implement this one in assembly code on your own. If it doesn't work, it's okay. It's not gonna be graded, okay? But the attempt to do it is important, okay? This is all getting recorded, so you, know, you have the, this, this, the, the entire code you know, already on YouTube. So I would try to do this over the weekend. Um, I, would, I can get it done you know, during the lab time today, so it's not gonna be a problem. Um, and for the lab time today, I would just be there to help you guys do your homework assignment, the division problem. Or for those of you who want to get started with this one, I can also help you with this one as well. All right, you all good? All right, so I will be over at the lab in about 10 minutes.